Welcome to Safety Factor. My name is Ben Hanks, and today we're talking about the dangers of using homemade lifting devices. I'm joined by a few below the hook experts. We're talking with Dale Kelly, engineering manager at Caldwell Lifting Solutions. Nice to be here. Talking with Dan Mongan, senior sales engineer from Caldwell as well. Hi there. And Jay Schrader, regional sales manager from Caldwell as well. Hello there. And I'm also joined by Kevin Brewer, below the hook sales specialist from Azella. Gentlemen, thank you for having us down to the Caldwell headquarters. You're welcome. Thank you. So, what is a homemade lifting device? Well, a homemade lifting device is considered a product that's not designed for the proper standards, such as ASME or the BTH. Many times I've seen customers uh, ask us to certify their product, and it can be a standard C-clamp where they modified it or put a different shackle or attachment on it. And of course, they're assuming the liability for that, and they ask us to prove it out. Those are the type of devices we try to not uh, certify, obviously, because they're unsafe and unreliable. What if a company has their own in-house engineers, and they engineer a below-the-hook device, but it's not made by a certified manufacturer? Is that considered a homemade device as well? It, it could be, yes, because of the traceability aspects of it. The... Uh, the Material that they're using is is unsubstantiated. It's not been certified. Uh, the traceability is a problem. Jay, you've probably seen this as well. I Absolutely. Many times we get called in to look at uh, it, it, more of a solution. They've been using something homemade for years. Um, you know, whether it's lifting a motor or something, and it just that's worked for them, but it's not to the safety standards that the uh, ASME B thirty point twenty six or BTH is called out to be. Yeah, one of the things that we see in the field a lot of times with, with homemade devices or devices that they've made in the plant is they may have an engineering staff that designed it and put it together, but the questions we try to ask is, you know, do they understand what the safety factors are? Do they understand what goes into making an approved BTH device per ASME? And then also not only the engineering aspect, but the traceability of all those parts like Dale was saying, you know, you've got to have traceability of all the steel that goes into it. So every piece, you've got to know its origination points. Um, the welder certifications, every weld that was put on that piece of equipment, you've got to be able to trace it back to the welder that did it and his proof of passing a welding test. Um, and then bulk, basically it, it boils down to risk mitigation for us. Um, you know, we, we try to you know, look at it in terms of if there's an accident or something happens and you're sitting in a courtroom, you know, who's who's going to be responsible and, and who's going to answer those yep. hard questions? Yeah, the liability is a big, big question in those type of situations. At the end of the day, we want everybody to go home that was using those equipment, so. So what are some of the consequences of using a homemade lifting device and having an accident? Uh, death of an employee would be the worst, but absolutely. OSHA fines. Might come into play. So let's look at the worst case scenario. You're using a homemade lifting device. There's a death of an employee. What what are some of the repercussions that you might be subjected to? Uh, definitely an OSHA investigation. Um, they're going to look into the accident, uh, what you were using, how you were using it, uh, what kind of training you've probably given your employees on how to use the equipment. Um, yeah, there's going to be several different factors there involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you also, you know, personal lawsuits and liabilities. Um, Absolutely. The, they pile up oh, so fast. Um, and so it's it's really, you know, to save a few hundred or a few thousand dollars making your own device versus buying one from a true below-the-hook manufacturer, um, it, it really just doesn't make sense in, in most applications. So what are the ASME requirements for below hook lifting devices? Depends. Um, there's different standards for different types of lifting devices. So each one of us has our own unique experience. The beams have one standard. My clamps have a different standard. And Jay's lifting points are all different. Standards. Usually it ranges in the safety factors like four to one for Jay's, five to one for my clamps. That's what we desire to I apologize. It's actually three to one for clamps, but we designed a five to one. Uh, 
And then there there's specific user instructions that apply where the operator has to, if he is following those guidelines, he has to follow those certain inspection levels. So there's a, a, a host of many different requirements that are required when you state you're meeting the ASME guideline, in addition to the actual design guidelines themselves. So, yeah, even appropriate labeling on the lifter. Very important. You know, that's real important. Um, technically, you're not even supposed to use a lifting device unless it has all appropriate labeling on it. That's so, right. So rarely do you, will you find a homemade device that's, that's even identified properly. Yeah, it must have the working load. Uh, in my case, it, the clamp must have the jaw opening. It must tell you the service class, the design category. And all that takes engineering and possibly design proof testing to determine those ratings that apply to that particular lifting device. Yeah, with with that, I mean, you've you've also got to have manufacturer's information, so you got to have some again that traceability. Um, and I, I think the BTH one current designs require a manufacturing date on them as well. It does. Mm-hmm. As, uh, as well as the uh, ASME mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, data manufacturer must be on it. And kind of back to what we were saying earlier with, um, you know, an, an engineer at, at a company that would design something, uh, even if they knew the appropriate design standard, there's specific calculations that are required. So so we look at uh, lateral buckling and things of that nature that, that maybe that engineer isn't, isn't aware that he's got to consider in, in the design. So, you know, we've, we've, the people in this industry have expertise really in designing and building everything. So, I mean, just simply, you know, why would somebody else want to build their own? So, I guess that's a good question. Why would somebody else want to build their own? What Trying are the to reasons? save money. A lot of times it's just saving money or time. You know, and, I, and I've walked into a facility where they really needed a, an eye bolt, so they took an actual socket head cap screw. Yeah. And they weld it on a washer on there, and they use that as their lifting device. Nowhere in the world should you be using something like that, but that was what they used at the time. And and I don't know if it was a save money or a save time, but it was you know it was their easy, cheap way to get out of it. Yeah, a lot of times it, it boils down to one of the two. It's either we we don't have a budget for doing it right, and so we do deal with what we can because production is tasked with getting a job done and they're not giving the funds to get the equipment they need to do that job. And so maintenance comes up with something Um, or it's time, you know, the getting the right part might take six, 10, 12 weeks versus my maintenance shop can build it this weekend. Mm -hmm. I can have it Monday. It's a lack of, lack of planning and consideration for the importance of lifting as well. A lot of times customers would come out there and say, I just need to move this from here to here. And they don't plan their list, which is one of the requirements you should be doing and that we teach in our training class, is you need to plan your lift as though it's part of an integral structure. Just like, you know, if you go out buying a car and you need to buy a set of tires for it, you know, you need to know what tire you buy. When you, when you orchestrate a lift, you need to do a lift plan and you need to follow that lift plan. And by doing that, you'll have the proper equipment ahead of time, including your PPE equipment so that you make a proper and safe lift. Very important to consider it as part of your manufacturing process. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. The, you know, uh, that was what I started to say, another factor in, in why they use homemade or not use the right thing is is training and awareness. Okay. You know, you, you have people on the manufacturing floor, they come in, that's all they've ever seen. They've not been trained properly. That's all they know. They, they don't know that there's a better option or a better way. And then those situations, it really falls on the company's responsibility to to have that training and, and make them aware of Absolutely. the yep. dangers of what they're doing. Many times we'll get a phone call and said, hey, I forgot I was going to have to lift this. Move know, I've, it. I've manufactured exactly. it. I, you know, it's built. It's sitting on the machine, and now i got to get it off the machine and, and do it to a secondary operation or you know, load it on a truck. And what do you guys have real quick? Well, yeah, I mean, that's not really a safe idea. I mean, that's, we should be thinking about this. And, you know, how can we make that lift? Yeah. You know, what equipment will we need? Exactly. What does your facility have? You know, we have to worry if we're using an overhead crane or if we're using some sort of a boom on a fork truck. I mean, what are we using to, to make that lift? So can a homemade below-the-hook lifting device, can it become certified at any point? 
it's possible if the the person could or the manufacturer could prove out all the requirements, but it's unlikely, you know, because you, your trainer, uh, your welder has to be trained. He know he needs to know the AWS standards, so he knows the weld properly. Uh, then the engineer has to know the, the codes as well as somebody in the industry. So is it doable? Yeah, but is it probable? No, it's not likely. We do this for a living. That's all we do is we eat, breathe, we know the standards. All of our welders are certified to go through a trained certification process. So we don't take chances and we do proof testing on all our products. And that takes a lot of money ahead of time. To build one piece, by the time you build it and test it, you can buy that product from a company that's done all that and has put the time and effort into it to ensure it's safe. So walk me through the process of developing a below-the-hook lifting device. Like, what does Caldwell do? What does Mazella do? Really spell out why it's a good idea to go to a professional. Explain the process. Well, I, I guess the first thing we got to do is is decide if, you know, as your example, is this an off-the-shelf, fairly straightforward lifting beam or spreader bar? Is it a fully custom-engineered lifting solution? I think a lot of that really starts with our end of things with the Mozilla and the sales, sales team that's out in the field, uh, meeting with that customer or end user, and, and really determining what their process is and what they need. And then once we establish what their process and need is, then, then we can sit down with um, you know, the manufacturing and, and with Caldwell's experts and, and put together the right solution. Um, whether it's a, a, a simple lifting beam or a rigging solution, or in a lot of cases, it's a combination of a beam and some rigging or a beam and some clamps, or you know, there could be several combinations of doing things different ways and determining which way is the most economical and safest. We, we more and more want to collaborate, of course, with Mozilla on the sales side and really get involved with the end user as well. Um, you know, because COVID hit, everybody is doing business differently, right? So, so we're doing all kinds of teams meetings now in which we involve everybody um, related to the project and, and really talk about the entire application from start to finish. So it's not just, you know, I need to lift this. It's what is each step in the process? Um, you know, what is the environment? All those kinds of questions. And then we put our expertise um, to that to help them come up with the best solution. And I've worked with Dan long enough to know that uh, he's a picture guy. So he wants to see pictures yeah, of the lift, pictures sure. of the equipment that we're lifting. What kind of crane do you have? What's yep. the crane hook? He likes to, the pictures tell the yep. story. Yep. And that really helps us kind of get the, the best solution for the end yeah, user. It's a great point. Yeah, an, over, an overlooked piece of that process a lot of times is, is the, the speed of repetition. You know, how quickly does the production process mm -hmm. take? Uh -huh. You know, is it something that we need to be able to, have we got plenty of time to rig? before we go, or do we need to go really fast? Yeah. Um, and, and that comes into, a, a, impacts a lot of what uh, the solution will be. What about insurance? I assume that if, like Mazelle and Cald will have the insurance to back up their devices, whereas a homemade lifting device may not, that's something that they may not even consider. True. Um, when a manufacturer designs its own product, He's assuming 100% liability for that product. So if it fails, it's on his back. When we sell him a product, the, the liability will lie with us. And of course, if there's something to wrong, then we're held accountable. So uh, it also it also comes down to proper use. Um, you know, if they if they buy this product but use it improperly. Well, good point. It, yeah, it yeah, goes, yeah, it goes, yeah, yeah, it's not our fault. We're good. <laughs> but, yeah. But we still get called in. You know, we're, we're still a part of that, that lawsuit and that mitigation process. And, and that's where the training becomes so important. Um, because, you know, these, it's dangerous. You know, I mean, even if you're only lifting 500 pounds, I mean, 500 pounds do a lot of damage if it falls on somebody. Um, and, and so you, you have to have proper training to use these. And that's a, that's a part of the, 
the insurance and the, the risk mitigation that I mentioned earlier is, is not only designing and developing and manufacturing the products the right way, but then training the end users to use them the right way. And a lot of times that falls on the, the buyer or the end user that company's responsible for making sure that those people are trained properly. Um, we provide them the opportunities for those trainings. Caldwell has training programs, Mozilla has training programs that we offer and can help with those, but it still falls on the responsibility of that customer to arrange that training. Absolutely. Unfortunately, they don't realize how important it is until after an incident. That's the sad part. And that, we like to see that change, of course. So what are some of the worst devices that you've seen out in the field being used? Jay's example was a pretty good one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I got a good one the other day. Uh, another sales engineer showed me some pictures and uh, a, a customer was literally lifting something that was resting on forklift forks by placing a sling through it and then using a two by four yes. in that sling. <laughs> so literally lifting, you know, a load with a two by four and then they were, they were flipping it, you know, turn it at 90 degrees to access it in a different way. So we immediately, um, you know, raised the alarm and, and sent very important information saying you need to cease doing that for sure. But we, again, you can't control what's happening out there. That's for sure. I've seen somebody take a piece of conduit and bend it at the top and make a, like kind of a, a master ring and then they bent it at the bottom and they were using it to, to grab items out of a, a bath of a, like a salt bath. Oh, wow. So, I mean, just that, seen, seen some similar yeah. devices like that made it from Alfred where they just take a piece yeah. of thread yeah. rod and bend it around mm -hmm. at the I've top. Seen that and they don't even weld it at the top, so, you know I mean? Just, yeah. just bend <laughs> it around. The load carried a hook, yeah. by the hook. It's, it's, uh, it's I've scary seen stuff. our clamps modified where they'll take the ring off and put a T-bar on it. And then the T-bar yeah. ended up getting <laughs> stuck down inside it and broke the guy's leg. And saw pictures of that. So right. even even modifying an existing clamp is not a good idea. Yeah. Even though it's certified, of course, I would say it more than warranty. But um, and, and it's crazy to think that it's not just a one-time thing. You see it once. It's it happens. I mean, probably once a month, I see some sort of a unique homemade lifting device, and you just kind of you kind of give it to them because they they were at least thinking about it, but uh, they weren't thinking about it the right way. Well, I've I've seen some pretty innovative homemade lifting devices. I mean, there you know you can't get around that. There's some talented people, um, you know, they're around this process all day, every day. So, uh, a talented maintenance guy or an engineer at that facility, they can really come up with something. But, you know, I would say, hey, if if you have these great ideas, present them to us. Let's let's collaborate and let's build a BTH certified piece of equipment that, that follows your, your thought process. Absolutely. So what do you say to someone who says, you know, like, I, I know this better than you. Like, I'm doing this every single day. I know the lifts that I need to make. I think that I can design something better than you can design. Well, you, you, you do tell them, like, hey, I understand that you know the process better, but I come from a lifting background, so let's, let's use... Like Dan said, let's collaborate yeah, to use it. Together. I mean, I'm not going to discredit yeah, that he knows the process. There's nothing absolutely that says you can't design his product into an ASME related, ASME approved product. But it is, it's just more than about the design process. It's about the traceability. It's about proving it works versus thinking it works. It's about using proper certification, certified welders. So it's more, it's a bigger picture. Yes, you can take that concept and work it into a very usable design and then still still can meet the ASME requirements. And we do that, you know, I have done that on some of our clamps. Dan's worked with me on project. I work with Dan on projects in conjunction. We'll come up with a with a system approach. We're doing one for a company right now where I designed the clamp and he designed the lifting rig system for the whole thing. So it's uh, pretty innovative. So we work together as a team. I mean, we just had a real simple one in which, uh, you know, a customer comes to us and say, they said, hey, we've been lifting bundles of lumber in this manner for years with this um, device. Can, can you build something very similar? 
And we certainly did. We quoted it and we built it. But again, the structure was BTH rated. Mm -hmm. But in addition, we, we required a latching mechanism to make sure it couldn't inadvertently open. And that's just something that if you're not in the lifting industry, you, you don't think about, hey, that really should be positively locked closed. Yeah. Um, but fortunately, they bought it from us. They've put that in place. You know, they've thrown away their own homemade device and, and now they've got safe equipment for their, their employees. So maybe there's some people listening to this and they've been using the same homemade lifting devices for forever and a light bulb just went off and they went, uh-oh. I yep. guess I'm in trouble. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> so what can they do to uh, become compliant, uh, especially if they've got a lot of lifting devices and, you know, maybe they don't have the budget right now to just go out and replace all of them. What what advice do you have for them? Start. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Contact, sure. contact Caldwell. Mozilla, Caldwell, get one of us involved. Let us take a look at your application and, you know, and rank them in order. You know, yeah. maybe this one here's the most dangerous. So let's look at that one first and we'll kind of work down from there. And but we'd like to see you get it, you know, all the homemade devices taken care of. And sometimes we might offer a standard product right out of the catalog that'll do exactly what they need. And sometimes we'll have to design something. But get us involved. Talk to us. We yeah. That. I mean, an example a few years ago, uh, um, a locomotive manufacturing facility, it was components. Uh, they had 35 different homemade devices in there. So flew out to their facility, gathered information on each one. And of course, it was a budget issue. So what we did was design and build three or four at a time. So we, we replaced four. They'd come back to us. We'd do another four and just kept working through that. Yeah, and, and like I said, you know, the biggest thing there is, is just start. You yeah. know, get, get started, do something. Yes. Um, you know, and, and working with us and, and we can help prioritize, uh, you know, which ones to start with. Like you said, maybe it's the most dangerous mm -hmm. application. Maybe it's the one that, uh, that's the heaviest, highest duty cycle usage. Um, and so we can take a lot of those things into, into consideration. And that just kind of triggered something, um, a, a thought processes with designing their own, um, Another piece that's overlooked a lot of times is duty cycles. How many times that device is going to be used over the course of its expected life is a major factor in the design. And a lot of times those homemade engineers don't understand to take that into consideration. You know, a, a metal fatigue will come into play with a device that, you know, its life expectancy is 20,000 pigs versus 200,000 pigs. And there's a different design mm -hmm. process that goes into that. Absolutely. You know, I think many times when uh, someone calls us and we, we ask and we actually have an internal application data sheet that we ask them to fill out. And a lot of times, uh, you know, I think they, they kind of think, oh, I wonder why they need all this information. But it's for us to give you the exact thing yeah. that you need, the proper item. It really helps on our end to understand your needs for your lifting solution. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you for having us uh, to your headquarters here to hosting us for the podcast. How can they get a hold of you guys? Where can they find you? www.caldwellinc.com. You could also see the JC Renfro website, www.jcrenfro.com. Our phone number is 1-800-628-4263. Ask for one of our sales reps, and we'll have Dan or one of the other customer service reps help you out. Be sure to visit CaldwellInc.com. And as always, you can get a hold of myself or Kevin or any of our other experts at MazellaCompanies.com. Don't forget to pop into our learning center. We have a ton of information there. We also have a ton of information on below the hook lifting devices. Subscribe to Safety Factor wherever you listen to your podcast, or you can watch it on the Lifting and Rigging channel on YouTube. Thanks for listening. Stay safe out there. <laughs>